We have a host of very interesting, experienced and articulate speakers that will bring us through the issues at hand, namely what is the nature of democracy, its limits, the threats that exist to democratic freedoms in this country and others, and how we might rectify this situation. Uh, everyone knows there are very pressing threats to fundamental freedoms and rights in this country and in others, and so uh, the speakers and myself and a few others who helped to organize the tour felt as if this was worth speaking about because we know how valuable it is we know to have a constitution, to have a democratic one at that, and also to honor the people who have created this country and our constitution and to carry on a legacy that has been handed to us. The dignity and the freedom of the human person is especially encased in uh, another trinity, which is our fundamental rights. And the fundamental rights are described in three ways in our Constitution. They're described as natural, inalienable, and imprescriptible. And they're all talking about the same thing, but in different ways. So natural means that that right, that fundamental right, is necessary to our nature. It's hardwired into our nature. Think of software and hardware. It's actually hardwired wired into our nature. And I'll give you an example. We're communicating social beings. That's in our nature. All of us must communicate. All of us are social beings. So that's the basis of the fundamental, the natural right for freedom of expression, freedom of speech. Because it's necessary to us, therefore we have an absolute right to that. Okay, inalienable, our rights, our fundamental rights, are inalienable because we can't make them alien. We can't separate them from ourselves. Even if we wanted to give them away, we can't separate them from us because they are, as I say, hardwired. They are part of us. And they're imprescriptible. And imprescriptible says that Basically, that means that no law, no prescription can take them away. That they are ours and that nothing can lawfully take them away. Of course, dictators and dictatorial governments and can take them away, but they can't lawfully do that. You still have that right, even if it's taken away from you. So, um, and what those are the fundamental rights. Now, and obviously, I will just mention here, but I will come back to it later, the most fundamental right is the one that all the other fundamental rights sit on. And that's the right to life. And when we talk about your right to freedom, and we talk about, you know, the freedom, uh, the right to life and the freedom to be born, when you defend those unborn children, you, in fact, become like them. You know, do not underestimate the evil that we face in this battle. This battle, when we talk about democracy, you know, there is no such thing as democracy in this day that we live in. Democracy does not exist. I mean, even in England, as we speak, they are trying to prevent people from praying outside abortion clinics. Once you come to political democracy, you only have man-made law. You no longer have eternal law, you no longer have the law of reason, natural law. All that is left is what we give ourselves through the procedure of voting. Therefore, you can vote anything away because you are giving yourself your own law. It is impossible to sustain in a political democracy that only believes in positive law inalienable rights. So the right to life is indefensible. If everything can be voted away and nothing has a foundation in objective reality, inalienable rights make no sense. We just happen to agree on that right now, but we could vote it away through a procedure. It is impossible to hold that the government could be limited in any way. And you see that Kathy was talking about the assembly deliberating about the notions of life and the Eighth Amendment. Think about that, right? The first inalienable right. And people are voting up and down 
trying to figure out who potentially could be left outside of the political extension of the law, right? That's what they're deliberating about. How far does the law extend vis-a-vis -vis the unborn? Right, do you see the problem of extension? You have no problem answering the question because you would say immediately, all human beings should be protected. Their right to life should be protected. Who is the subject of these protections? Every member of the human species from the moment that it is first identified, regardless of race, gender, political affiliation, stage of development. So you go like that because you believe in foundations. The assembly and the post-democratic no, post notions, uh, post-modern notions of democracy can't figure anything out because they don't believe in foundations. This is where we're going. We're in Never Never Land. But what happens next is not funny. Because what happens next is genocide. The same logic, which is absurdity in the extreme, brings us to a new scenario in which Patrick Kavanagh's formulation that tragedy is merely underdeveloped comedy is turned upside down. Because the comic, there's nothing comic from now on. Because here we have the next stage of the, amen, of the assault on our, on our uh, fundamental rights, the annihilation of children, as I say. Um, and that's achieved in lots of ways, but one of the ways it's achieved is that there's a picture being drawn every day and the baby isn't in it, or the baby's in the darkest, darkest corner of the picture. You can't make out what's in there. Is there anything there? You never see the baby, you never hear the baby, you never hear of the baby. It's as if all of this is about the rights of the woman. And there's a terrible imposition on the woman, like some kind of disease or something that's been imposed by bad people, or a spell that needs to be lifted. And the strange thing is that like sensible people, previously people who wouldn't hurt a fly, are sitting around with their arms folded saying, well, no, I, I, I wouldn't be in favor of nine months, but you know, we need to do something. No, you know. I want very unlimited abortion, like, but uh, you know, there's no difference between nine months and 12 weeks, morally. There's no difference between 12, nine months and one day, one hour. It's still a human being. It's murder, that's it. We don't need to go into that. There is no problem of human beings that can be solved by the, the annihilation of a defenseless and innocent human being. There are non-negotiables in democracy. There are certain proposals that are illicit, morally illicit to propose a vote on. One of them is you cannot vote on who lives and who dies in a democratic society. That is not democratic, that is totalitarian. You don't have the right to vote on who gets killed in Ireland, to put it plainly. You cannot imagine that the powers of being a democratic citizen for you extend to, I am going to cast a vote to decide who lives and who dies, and at what age of development that will occur. I hope you don't imagine that you really honestly have that power. That the government is claiming that this work of the assembly is democratic is obviously a ruse. You should be appalled. If you can say it's okay to remove the fundamental right of life, which all other fundamental rights sit on. No other fundamental right is safe. No one's life is safe, no one's property, no one's any other fundamental right, freedom of speech, etc., is safe once life goes. You know, dare you call abortion murder? Dare you? And you know, there's a, a quote from um, George Or Orwell, a great, an author and journalist, and he says, you know, political language is designed to make lies sound truthful and murder respectable. We know that with God, with us, 
all things are possible. We have to believe that all things are possible, even stopping Ireland from legalising abortion. One of the greatest disasters that has happened to our country, there were two great disasters in the last century, in my opinion, two great disasters. One was the execution on the 3rd of May 1916 of Porrick Pierce, who understood the nature of nationality, the nature of leadership, the nature of slavery, the nature of the post-colonial condition, all of these things which we desperately needed from our leaders and lacked subsequently. So that was the, great, the greatest tragedy up to that point. The second greatest tragedy was the prosperity, so-called, that began in the 1990s. Because whatever hope we had had of realising the extent of our situation, of our difficulty, this wiped it out. Because it meant that this, uh, an entirely false sleight of hand which created a pseudo form of prosperity, which was subsequently replaced by a, a false form of poverty, of austerity. This was used to break our nation's spirit, finally, and to bring us to the state, all as a people, more or less to the kind of condition of our leadership, so-called. Because we were seduced by the idea of materialism, this thing that Pierce warned about. That if you conceive of a nation as a material thing, you're on the way to perdition.